Coming up on the program, we're going to talk about what the Victory Garden was and what happened to it, plus four exciting vegetables that kids and adults like to grow. Our guest this week is author Helen Yotes, and a whole lot more. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast is permeating into your ears with your host, Joey Beck. And it could be the weeds. Some gardeners try to get all the weeds out of their garden. Other gardeners leave them in their garden. It's really a decision that you need to make. There's benefits to both sides of that. It's just something that you need to figure out what you want to do for your garden. And holly bird. Canning is a science. When you're canning, you want to make sure you follow the directions, follow the recipe, don't cut corners, don't replace things. It's crucial to you, your health, and your family. They're professional gardeners with full-time jobs. And they're on the air now. Welcome, friends, to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast, a podcast for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide. I am your host, Joy Barrett. Alongside is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Barrett. Behind the TWVG microphone here at the WI Garden Media Studios in Southeast Wisconsin, the information that you are going to hear is important and practical to your particular growing garden. You just may have to tweak some of the dates and times that you apply it for in the zone that you're living. If you're tuning in, you're either a gardener who wants to be a better gardener, a new gardener who wants to learn, or just want to gather more information. You probably know who we are already, but briefly we will cover what we do, who we are, and then we'll get into our main topic of the program. We are professional gardeners who create online videos for you on high definition, high quality, well edited videos to teach you how to grow organically, what to do with the food you grow, and how to be more self sustainable, which you can find all on our website at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. We do a quarterly digital magazine. We do it all in-house. Holly and I divide the stories up. We write them, and we uh, put them in a nice digital downloadable file for you. You can also read it online or print it directly off of your computer, as well as you can check it out on the mobile device, and we can, and you can also check out all of our previous podcasts that we've done at the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Click on the podcast tab at the top of the page. You can find those who support, support this program as well as all the previous episodes that we have produced. Well, let's get into our first, our main topic this week, and it's about the Victory Garden. For those of you who are younger, you may have heard the term but are not familiar with what the mindset or the motivation behind it were. Some of you who are listening remember this or have been told from family members about the experiences of creating a victory garden. Let's talk about first what it was, how it came to be, and kind of what's happened to it. So the victory garden was initiated during World War II, when, and even after World War II, but it encourages families to go up and grow their own food. If there was a food shortage, this would help with that. Well, there was there, yeah, there, there, was, there was a lot of yeah. rationings during WW2. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, the call was put out by the, the government to produce victory gardens, to grow what you could wherever you could grow it. It's also encouraged to, to can the items you grow and preserve it for winter as well. Kind of the prepping of the 2000s, I guess. The preparedness, uh, trying to be more self-sustainable. But this was encouraged by the government to do this. Right. Two-thirds of American households heeded the call of the United States government during this time. So that would be about approximately 20 million households. And during the time of the Victory Garden, during during WW2, World War II, approximately 40% of the vegetables and fruits that were produced in the United States were produced in Victory Gardens. So then, this is a- after that, there was a shift. Once the people came back from, from war, there was, was a shift in how things went. Horses uh, and hand tools converted over to combines and computers. We moved into a new age of agriculture where the big ag companies uh, saw a place where money could be made where uh, the, the chemical companies saw a need that they felt they could meet. There was also a boom in population. People were coming home for more. They were starting to have larger families, and the population was growing. So the Victory Gardens faded away. 
or at least the, the mindset, the encouragement of gardening uh, from the powers to be at the government was not encouraged anymore because they were uh, encouraged to buy commercially available produce and grains and food. Right. So this shifted. And Secretary of State at that time was Henry Kissinger, and he had a famous line that said, you control oil, you control nations, you control food, you can control the people. And that's kind of where a lot of you who are listening to this program is kind of in the same mindset that, that we as the people uh, here in the United States, and we're, we're heard all over the world, but what's going on in the United States is that the government's controlling the people by the food. Right. So when you think about that, you think about how they are shipping food in, bringing or shipping food out, bringing food in. It, it's a it's a food trade surplus and a food trade deficit. We're shipping out cheap food and importing the food food that is important to human health, which is completely backwards. If we have the means and the capabilities of growing what we need, why are we shipping to other countries? And, and this brings up, and this has nothing to do with vegetables. But the USDA has said it was okay for chickens to be shipped to China to be butchered and then shipped back to the United States for us to buy at our local gro- uh, grocery store. And that is happening right now. So it's not something that's going to happen. It's happening right now. So if you're concerned about that, we would suggest you look into where your chicken's coming from. But that, I mean, that's just a side note. But that's that's where the food uh, the, the food system is at right now. When we are taking items that we are producing in America, shipping it to other countries for, 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 for to, to butcher out or to manufacture and ship back for us to consume, something is off on that circle. As well as, you know, with the Victory Garden, you know, we, we, the TV show on PBS, that was a Victory Garden. Some of you are familiar with that. That's, that, that's one thing. But, but the Victory Garden in itself has kind of gone away. But... It's kind of coming back mm-hmm. because people, at least in more r- urban settings, are wanting to know where the food comes from, locally grown. Greenhouse farming is becoming a very big thing now, even though the United States is the last in the world in greenhouse production. If you buy a, a, a tomato in the grocery store in winter, 50% of those have been grown somewhere outside the United States and shipped in. The ones that I buy come from Canada. They're greenhouse grown in Canada. China leads the way in this greenhouse market with 2.8 million acres of greenhouse space devoted to edible food uh, production for consumption. Back to the urban food growing. This has become more popular as people want to know where their food comes from. So... This is where where this kind of comes in or draws all together, is you have to think about the space you have, to think about what you want to grow and what you can buy locally. So maybe, perhaps that you can grow tomatoes, but you want to buy your potatoes from a local farmer. That's the situation you may want to look at. So we can still make a difference. We can still get back to our roots. And the good thing is, is that you might still have people in your family that remember this, or heard about it. So or or part of now the big ag industry, right. which is not necessarily their fault. They've been put into a corner by chemical companies and, and seed manufacturers saying, if you do this, we will help you out by doing X, Y, and Z. Promises are made. And if the farmer doesn't follow those promises, they don't, they're not able to, to produce or to, to grow or farm at all. Right. So it's something to think about. Think about how you can encourage others. You know, maybe you have a neighbor that is has shown interest in, in your garden, and maybe you can encourage them, help them out, help get them started, or somebody you know from work or church or school. Now, Victory Gardens, as we spoke about just moments ago, was encouraged by the United States government because of the rations that wartime uh, uh, results in. Rationing of food, everybody focused on the wartime efforts. There's a lot of really good videos on YouTube where you just type in the Victory Garden where there is the the programs that were broadcast on television about how to do Victory Gardens about and it's the old time footage. Now move 60, 70 years later 
where the government, municipalities, townships uh, are, are fining people, virtually running them out of their homes for front yard gardens. Right. It's become real backwards, and we need to work together to make it become what it should be, which is encouraging people to become more self-sustainable. Control the food, control the people, and that's the way it's been since the time he said that back after World War II. <clears throat> in order to, you know, if you're in an area where it's in, uh, forbidden to grow a garden in the front yard, there is ways to kind of sneak around that by putting edible trees, edible bushes, you know, blueberries, blackberries, etc. Other plants that are not the typical, oh, that's a cucumber, oh, that's a tomato, oh, that's an eggplant type. You can, you know, there's leafy greens, there's uh, Swiss chard, for example, that add a lot of color. But to the normal, everyday person who tries to find violators, they're really not going to know what they're looking for because they're not educated in that area. Uh with that being said, uh, I mean, on the last program we had Kate Cottrell. She has an urban front yard garden in Los Angeles, and, and they just now passed uh, a ruling to where you could grow in the parkway. This is one of the few cities in the country. The parkway is that patch of grass between the street and the sidewalk, which is owned by the city. But, but you have to maintain it. But maintained, or, or you, as a homeowner, you're supposed to maintain it. They have allowed gardens and food to be grown in that particular that parkway or that that space between the the road and the and the sidewalk in front of your house and by the movement that local urban uh food i think that's going to be kind of a a, a main stage to where people will see that that is a viable piece of of real estate when it comes to gardening in your property, on your property, if you have very little space, that may be a place that, that you can get away with gardening. So you have to think about these things of, of what you can do, what maybe you can do to make a difference or encourage others because I feel it's, it's become very important. Think about the drought in California and how that's going to greatly affect a lot of the crops that are shipped to the rest of the United States. Ninety-eight, what is it? Ninety-six percent of strawberries, ninety-eight percent of head lettuce, uh, celery. Uh, asparagus, uh, fill in the blank, a lot of the produce that we get gets shipped from Southern California. Southern California, for those of you who may be outside of the United States or are not really informed of what's going on there, they've been in a seven-year drought. If they would, right today, start getting average normal rainfall, it would take approximately seven to eight years to get back to normal levels. Projections are showing that there is no uh, no sign, no, no sight in future that that's going to happen. So you will begin to see the prices accelerate and skyrocket because water from reservoirs as well as underground water is disappearing. So think about what you can do to lessen the impact on your particular area, your your what you can do to save money and to grow a little bit more of what you enjoy eating over the summer months. We'll be right back after this. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautiful. Beautifully with the Embrace. Available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. Paradigm Garden, Wisconsin's largest progressive garden center. Located in Madison, Wisconsin, Paradigm Gardens offers the largest selections of soil amendments, organic and salt-based plant nutrients, grow lights, and hydroponic systems available in the Midwest. 
Our knowledgeable and experienced sales staff are always available to help. Visit our new website, www.paradigmgardens.com, or visit our retail store at 4501 Helgeson Drive, Madison, Wisconsin, just off Stoughton Road. It's all about the soil at ManureTea.com. With their grass-fed, antibiotic, and growth hormone-free cattle and horses, owner Annie Haven puts the quality in her premium soil conditioner. 100% organic and natural, whether feeding your flowers or veggies, indoors or outs, you can grow organically with confidence. To purchase authentic Haven brand manure tea, small orders or large, go to manuretea.com. Always free shipping! Hi, this is Dave Ledoux from BackToMyGarden.com. Discover your passion for gardening. You're listening to two of the greatest gardeners in the world, Holly and Joey Baird, on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. Joey and Holly Baird here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast, homepage of WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, rocking the organic gardening world. For more information on our sponsors and how you can connect with them, you can visit our website at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and click on the podcast tab. Four fun, exciting vegetables for kids to grow, in addition to their parents, or just if you're an uh, uh, individual, individual uh, that likes exciting vegetables, these four will give you a bonus one, which will be five, maybe something that you have grown, or if you've got kids or grandkids, this would be a fun addition to the garden and get them involved in gardening. So, one that is always fun to grow because it's quick, so because kids don't always have a lot of patience, is radishes. Radishes, based on the variety that you purchase, will take between 17 to 35 days. Some of the uh, longer uh, ranges is 50 to 60 days based on what type of radish you're getting. The typical red champion radish, 17 to uh, 35 days. And you can, realistically, you can go out there every day and see it getting bigger and bigger. It's not something that takes you weeks to see a change. It can be done, you know, within hours you can see changes of that particular uh, vegetable. And the nice thing about radishes, you can grow them in any form. You can square foot gardening, traditional row gardening. Square foot gardening, you can get 16 radishes in one square foot. So you can pack a lot of radishes in a very small space and still have a lot of production. In addition, in addition, you can use the intercropping method, which means, let's say you are planting rows of corn. You can go ahead and drop, well, corn's a bad example because corn's a hot weather crop. Let's say you're planting lettuce, rows of lettuce. You can put radishes rows between the rows of lettuce. Lettuce takes 50 to 60 days to reach maturity. Radishes are going to reach maturity between 17 and 35 days. So you can harvest those radishes and then open up that center so where you can get in there and harvest the, that lettuce. So you can utilize the, the maximize the space you have available. But uh, radishes are a very fun crop to grow. Tops are edible. Kids may not like the tops. Uh, we don't care much for the tops either. They make a great addition to the compost pile, though. So that's and one they are thing. delicious roasted in the oven. Uh, radishes, not the tops. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can also eat them raw. You can cut them raw, uh, cut them thin, eat them raw, and use them as a, a garnish that way. So then we have another root vegetable, which is kind of fun to grow, is carrots. Carrots uh, are take will take about seventy days to uh, reach maturity, based on your your variety. And there's there's all kinds of carrots, uh, all kinds of colors that are available to plant. There's not just the traditional orange carrot, as many of us are familiar with, that we see at the local grocery store. So there's red carrots, purple carrots, yellow carrots, orange carrots, white carrots. Yeah. Yeah, the black mm-hmm. carrots. Uh, so there's all kinds. And again, these can be, I think these are the same thing as the radish. I think 16 per square foot, you can squeeze them in. You can grow radishes uh, in addition to carrots in containers if you don't have space available. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to get them uh, in a three-gallon minimum container. I, that's that's really a safe size. Another fun thing to do if you're growing radishes or carrots is to start making seed tape. And that's easily done with paper towel or, or toilet paper. And that could get, get the kids involved if they're kind of into crafty stuff. You know, they can make their own seed tape. And because those seeds are so small, it makes it easier for planting. Well, for those who are maybe not familiar with seed tape, it's the, you lay it out on, the, you lay toilet paper out on a flat surface and you pre-space the seeds. You fold the toilet paper over, mix it, uh, uh, adhere it to itself with water and flour so you don't have to try to, like Holly said, space the seeds out. You just roll the tape out, cover it up with soil, done. Much cheaper to do it at home, 
the you can do pretty much any seed uh, in seed tape. Uh, when you buy at the grocery or at the grocery store, when you buy at the local garden center, there's limited um, varieties that you can pick from. They can be quite expensive too. But by doing it at home, it is a, it's a time consuming deal. We've done this. It, it does take a while, but also on a cold winter night, you can do this any time of year, right. and you can build up your surplus of seed tape. So when it's time to plant, what normally would take you ten minutes to do will take you two minutes to do. Right. So then we have uh, tomatoes. Most kids like tomatoes, especially if they can see them grow and then pick them off the vine, especially like cherry cherry varieties. Uh, to, to cherry varieties, beefsteak varieties, 50 to 95 days is kind of what your range is on, on the tomatoes there for maturity. Again, every color of the rainbow imaginable. But if you're going to grow them with children involved, you're going to want them as Holly said, to grow a cherry variety because they can hold it in their hand and they can eat it. You don't have to slice it up for them. And that really connects them with the food. Yes, definitely. It, it makes them feel, it's very tangible for them. Those can be grown in containers very well. Do keep in mind that tomatoes fall into three different categories. Determinant, indeterminate, and semi-determinate. With cherry varieties, the majority of your typical cherry variety tomato is going to be an indeterminate, which means it will grow indefinitely. It'll just vine until it gets cold and freezes and dies. They're, they do make uh, some small cherry varieties that are container uh, types. I believe those are hybrids. So kind of keep in mind what you're going to plant in a container in the instance that uh, you don't have a lot of space to allow it to vine with. So then we have uh, another fun one that a lot of kids like is potatoes. And potatoes are, since they're a root crop, it kind of gives you a surprise, an element of surprise. And also, when you dig them up, it's like a garden treasure hunt. Potatoes will take, uh, again on your variety, 50 to 135 days to reach maturity based on where you're growing it. Now, potatoes are a cool weather crop. They're, 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 once the soil exceeds 85, 90 degrees, the potato will die off because it's not uh, a plant that's, that you can grow in hot conditions. Now, if you, are, if you have a longer growing season, let's say you're in the southern portions of the United States, you can do this in two different time frames. If you have a potato variety that takes about 60 days to reach maturity, 60, 70 days, you can plant them very early in the spring and then time your time your uh, dates off in the fall and get another crop in late summer and harvest them into mid-fall and you can do it like two times. Now where we're at here in southeast Wisconsin, you we could play that game but it's going to be very, very close on the frost dates. When potatoes... Uh, get frost, they're going to die. The tops die off. If you plant them too early and they emerge from the soil and they get frost, it doesn't kill the potato. It kills the top growth. The potato will re-germinate that top growth, but it does really back down on the speed of the maturity that it takes because it's got to focus all its energy on regrowing that top growth rather than putting emphasis on the tuber size. But for kids, you can do this in containers. This is really fun and easy in containers for adults, too, who don't like to do a lot of digging and hunting, you can just tip the container out, grow bag out, and they're there. So uh, you want to get at least a 5 to 10 gallon uh, container uh, for soil filling for, for the potatoes to grow in. And let's, say, let's, let's go with another one. Green beans are a very easy plant to grow for kids and adults alike. Right, so green beans are fun because they grow on a vine. You're going to usually trellis them, uh, pole beans particularly, and then there are some bush varieties. But they're fun to see grow up. You know, the, the kids like to watch them grow, see the growth happen. And then also they can pick those right off the vine as well. 50 to 60 days on the bush variety, 60 to 70 days on the pole variety. And typically with these beans, these just regular green beans, we're not talking about hard shell beans, they will produce really heavy for about two to three weeks, and then that's pretty much the extent of that production. So you would want to uh, secession plant. Uh, plant some beans 
For example, if you were planting them now, you plant them now, wait two weeks, plant another batch, wait two weeks, plant another batch. These are a warm weather crop, so you want to wait until all danger of frost has passed before you put them in the ground, just like you would cucumbers or tomatoes. But that's another way to get green beans all the way up through uh, the time that it's going to be too cold and they're going to die off. You can plant these in containers as well. We've done them in self-watering containers, been very, very successful at them. We've done them in raised beds, very successful. They're very versatile plant. And they will produce their own nitrogen that they need for green growth. So that's another thing. And they come in purple, green, yellow beans. So there's, there's a variety of different colors that you can pick from. That was the bonus one on the four vegetables plus one that, that you would like to grow if you have kids. Or if you don't have kids, they are exciting to grow even for yourself. And tasty. We'll be right back after these messages with our guest... Helen Yost, author Helen Yost. Right back after this. Kapow is an American company that grew out of the need to develop an everyday product that would help us decrease our equal footprint. Utilizing the mason jar as its foundation, Kapow has created accessories turning your mason jar into a multi-use device. Drinking lids and lunchbox adapters, plus so much more. Made entirely in the USA from carefully selected food-safe plastic that is just the right thickness for both durability and ease of use. For hot and cold beverages, certified safe for all ages and dishwasher safe too, get your Kapow accessories. Visit Kapow. A gardener knows that the key to a good plant is its roots. With poor roots, the end result is not good. Conventional pots and trays cause roots to wrap around and become root-bound. Then you try to unwrap the roots at the time of planting, hoping not to break them. But never again with the Root Maker, a non-chemical innovation that naturally air prunes roots to create more vigorous roots. Never a root-bound plant again. Whether trees, flowers, or edibles, home gardener or commercial grower, more roots means healthier, more productive plants. To get your own, visit RootMaker.com. I'm Mike Novak from the Mike Novak Internet Experience. And a day without Joey and Holly Baird is like a day without the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. Wait, that's the same thing. Oh, well, here they are. Welcome back to the program, everybody. For those of you who want to know more about the sponsors you've just heard, you can visit the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and click on the podcast tab at the top of the page. Support them because they support us and believe in the same gardening beliefs as we do. Those links are also in the show notes. Helen Yost is an author, a gardener, who is curious about the history of plants and what they can provide for us in this day and age. She's an award-winning freelance writer and a garden stylist. Her latest book, Plants with Benefits, is an uninhibited guide to aphrodisiac herbs, fruits, flowers, and veggies in your garden. She's also the author of Gardening with Confidence, 50 Ways to Add Style for Personal Creativity. Welcome to the program, Helen. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, spending a little bit of time with us to share some of your knowledge about gardening. Well, I love talking about gardening, so this will be easy. So how did you get started in gardening? Well, I... I um. Well, I had a choice, I guess. My um, mom was inside watching soap operas. <laughs> my dad was outside in the garden, and it looked like a lot more fun. <laughs> so okay. I started gardening with him when I guess it was about seven. And um, he he came from that generation where he grew plants because he had to. And then as a young boy during the Depression, and then as an adult, he did it because he wanted to. And uh it could have easily been lost because that was the era when we were, when we were all, you know, so happy with the new new waves of the world, supermarkets and you know, grocery stores, um, and they wanted a lot of people wanted to leave the old ways behind, but my dad still wanted to kind of keep his hand in it, and um, it grew from there. Well, that's definitely uh, I think where a lot of people kind of learn about gardening. Now. In all of your research about the history of plants, what is one thing you learned that was kind of maybe shocking to you or stuck out to you the most? What's something that really stuck with you? Well, when I, you know, when I did Plants with Benefits, well, I think the beginning, the beginning of it was what really shocked me that there was a genre <laughs> that, that 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 there even were aphrodisiac plants. I don't know why I'm sounding so naive, but um, when my publisher asked me to write the book because I was going to write it about um, 
beneficial plants for wildlife, so like host plants and nectar plants and that sort of thing. And um, then it went on to aphrodisiac plants. This is a long story that you know went from A to B, but it went there. <laughs> And I said, well, I don't even really know what the history of these plants are. And so we kind of started with the avocado. I was working on another story about the avocado. And I said, gee, I wonder if this plant is an aphrodisiac. And I, I would look at the plant and I, or at the avocado in the grocery store, pick them up. Mm. You know, some are smooth, some are dimply. I said, is it this pear shape that all women hope to have the beautiful figure one day? Is it the... Is it when you cut it open? Is it the the well on one side, um, or is it the you know the seat on the other? Kind of how beautiful pregnant women are. I just didn't really know what it was, and then I learned that the Aztecs call it. Can I hope I can say this? But they call it the testicle tree. It's because they grow in pairs, and it was okay. so yeah. So it was so feared by the um, Aztecs that they would. Uh, they would lock up their virgin daughters during harvest for fear that um, they would want to spend more time with the field hands. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. And it became, you know, one thing after another. Cleopatra is in there. King Henry VIII is in there. And, and, and how they used these plants to, for their conquest or trying to, you know, have a son or to be virile or... Like Casanova, we eat celery every day. That's and he believed it was the celery that kept him so virile. And so it was really interesting. And it's and it's written from a conversation standpoint, like you know something safe that you could talk to other people about at a party. But I guarantee you'll never look at guacamole the same way. <laughs> Now, you uh, spoke about that this wasn't even the topic of, of choice that you were going to write about, that your publisher had wanted you kind of go in this direction. For new, inspiring uh, gardeners who feel that they may have the knack for writing a book of, of whatever topic garden-related, what is the biggest tip that you can give them from you being a very, a, a very knowledgeable and successful garden writer yourself in the author category? Well, one, I, I think everyone, a writer should write every day. That's just me. And it doesn't even have to be good, and you don't even have to make it good. And I think we self-edit ourselves too much when you should just put great information down. But as far as um, going forward and finding your niche, well, first find what your niche is. Mine happens to be organic, sustainable, wildlife, in adding elements into the garden. So, you know, it's more on the design side. And, um, not, you know, so, like, I, I grow more fruit than, say, lettuce. I mean, I'm not a vegetable garden in that regard, but I have raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, figs, crab apples, and I, and I process these. I, I eat them raw and I put them up. But I don't think I would be qualified to write, you know, a, a, a volume on edible um, I was going to say edible berries, but I'm, getting, I'm writing a book on berries. So I'm going to scratch that. I just say, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not the person that's going to be the the one that says I am the authority on growing fruit trees because there are really great fruit tree growers out there, and they may not even be writers per se, but if they have the knowledge, a good publisher is going to work with them. And it's to me, it's persistence. It's just you know you get turned down by a lot of um, get turned down by a lot of uh, publishers, and then someone is going to pick you up. But you know, on a side note to all that, which is how we found each other, um, and a good example with my publisher, and I'm allowed to tell this story because it is he told me I can, and it's really interesting. But he had a a designer come to him, and she um, wanted to write this book, and it's out. It's called Heaven Is the Garden. And it's a beautifully done book. It's gotten grave reviews. But he turned it down 18 months earlier and said, you know what, in this market we all have to sell ourselves too, and you don't have a social media presence. So um, go build Facebook and go you know, start a blog. And you know, if you're a writer, you're going to write. So you know, a blog is a great place to do that. And she built a huge audience in a short amount of time. They published the book, and the rest is history. 
Mm. Uh, now, you spoke about you've got fig trees and berry bushes, a, a, a perennial garden of sins. For people who are looking for that type of garden, which is you know low maintenance if done right, what are some of the keys that you need to focus on if you've got a plot of land and you're going, I want to put a perennial garden here so I don't have to mess with it anymore? What are some of the do's that, that that individual, that gardener, one of our listeners need to follow? Well, I think it's best to put it in as a mixed border instead of a straight perennial border because, I mean, it's kind of semantics in a lot of ways because a lot of evergreens are perennial, but it, you don't want that garden just to go fallow in the off seasons you want to be able to still have something of beauty in there during the winter um our winters aren't nearly as um interesting as yours but you know conifers are great they add a lot of pop and then they go fade in the background during the summertime if you're putting in um you know pollinator plants or other fruit trees that are deciduous or um it it um, just adds structure to the garden and I, and I guess it's kind of hard for me to say because we can go, I, will, I can go in my garden today. It was 39. For us, that's a little chilly, but it's still very, very doable. And it was sunny out and we don't have snow. So, I mean, I'm in the garden year round. Um, so for somebody that is viewing it, say, from their kitchen window, you still, it's still nice to have rhythm in there and structure and evergreen all for the wildlife as well because they're always looking for places to cover cover if they need to get away from a predator definitely now speaking of wildlife for gardeners who cannot have a beehive or um, have a beehive situation what are some of the key flowers that attract the pollinators and the bees but also helps them thrive well for us and um, I'm, I'm assuming kind of our list is native and it probably has a long big region um, but one thing you don't even think about from a tree standpoint is like a red maple. I don't know if you, y'all grow red maples up there. The bees, that's a really early bee pollinator. Those are great. You don't see them, but they're there. We have my main street coming into my neighborhood is lined with these old maples, and every year you can just see the bees hovering around there. But anything in the prunus family, your apples, perries, cher- uh, cherry, crab apples, red bud. Can y'all grow red, red bud? Yeah, um, that's the yeah. Yeah, hollies. But from a flower standpoint, any of your herbs, you know, we're so quick to cut off the flowers because we want to harvest the herb. But like a basil in the summertime, oh, my gosh, it's a bee magnet. Most people are cutting the flowers away because they want to keep the leaves tender for harvesting. But if you let some of those go, you'll bring in, you you will never have to worry about anyone pollinating your cucumbers because they will be there. Mint. Um, and again, you know, you, some of these plants, well, you'd like to put them along your path, but they're going to be such bee magnets that you want to kind of put them a little bit off the path. So uh, oregano, uh, chives, that's another big one in early spring. And then you, you shrubs, you, your, your, your annuals like poppies and, and soybean and uh, cosmos and cleome. I mean, they're all just great. For bees, so they don't necessarily even be, need to be native, but um, they just need to be um, available in all seasons. So to be able to have something, so if it does does warm up in the middle of winter, that they have a place to go break and um, get some nectar to kind of kind of carry them over. Um, and then there are plants that are indicators of other pollinators coming in, like um, columbine is an indicator of when it's in bloom. That's when the hummingbirds are likely to come through. So planting columbine helps, so you know, feed, nourish them as they make their trek back up north. Now uh, you've got a you know a lot of great information here, but you people can go to your website, your blog, which is gardeningwithconfidence.com, and you have a lot of more information there as well as where people can purchase your books. Correct? That's right. Yes, I'd love that. And uh, if they choose to get an autographed copy, they can do that as well. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, H- Helen, I appreciate, we appreciate you coming on the program, sharing your knowledge that, uh, you know, it takes a lifetime to acquire and trying to help us with that uh, at, at, our, at our young age. <laughs> uh, age builds wisdom and, and people look towards individuals like you to help them be better gardeners year after year. And we appreciate you coming on the program. Thank you. I'd love to do it again anytime. And we'll be back right after this. Oh, yeah. What 
you say. You say nasala kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala kombucha makes your body smile. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear, penetrating product called Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your bare, untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts. Internal Wood Stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatings.com. It's Joey and Holly Bear of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast taking a moment to remind you that you can sign up for a weekly email so you don't miss anything that we do, our podcasts, our videos, our digital quarterly magazine. You won't miss anything by signing up. Just go onto our website on the right hand side. There's a, a big button for you to press. Just go ahead and sign up right now. And you can also ask us questions underneath that big green button. There's a big red button. So sign up for our emails for free. No spam, and if you've got a question, you can send us that as well. WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health conscious organic gardener worldwide. Hey, this is Craig. And this is Larry from the Urban Farm and Garden Show. And when I'm not in the barn shoveling, and I'm not out in the garden digging up carrots, we're listening to Joey and Holly Baird from the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. So apparently, vegetables are more than just to eat something yes. with the aphrodisiac. So, to find more information about our sponsors, you can visit our website at the WisconsinVegetableGarner.com and click on the podcast tab. We're not done yet. We've got two more topics to cover before we wrap the show up. First is Gardening in Two Minutes. Gardening in Two Minutes is an audio production that Holly and I produce on a weekly basis for a number of podcasts and a few radio programs. If you would like Gardening in Two Minutes on your particular program, contact us through the website and we'll be more than happy to get you that for your program. This Gardening in Two Minutes is about building your soil. This Gardening in Two Minutes is sponsored by Body, Mind, and Soil Hose-In Filtration System. Don't poison your soil with municipal water. Attach a Body, Mind, and Soil Hose-In Filter to it. Average use is 25,000 gallons before replacement is needed. And here is Gardening in Two Minutes. This is Gardening in Two Minutes. Building the fertility of your soil is one of the most important jobs gardeners have to get a harvest worthwhile out of their garden. Many people don't realize that soil is 90% of gardening. Without good soil, you're not going to have good plants. There's many diseases in your soil, and having good, healthy soil will prevent your plants from having diseases and encourage them to grow. One thing you can do is you can incorporate compost into your soil. This can include organic compost that you may purchase, but it could also include compost that you make yourself, that you could layer in or just spade in, or you could till it in. You can. We recommend just taking the compost and covering the top of your beds or growing area a half inch or so with whatever the amount of compost you have available instead of actually tilling it in because the rain and moisture will work it down into the soil as well as worms will come up and feed off of it. Another thing you can do is you can add organic fertilizer. There's things like just blood mill, bone mill, organic all-purpose fertilizer, and even things like compost tea, like manure tea, for example. You can also add coffee grounds. Coffee grounds are nitrogen-rich, and they encourage worms to come to your garden, which will aerate the soil and will bring nutrients up from the bottom of your soil. So if you've had problems in the past with, uh, with pro- plants not growing properly, it could be because the soil is not properly managed and doesn't have the adequate fertilization that it needs in it. For more information on soil fertility, our weekly video productions, as well as our free downloadable digital quarterly magazine, you can find all that information at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. For the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide. For Gardening in Two Minutes, I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. Before we get out of here today, we're going to talk about your garden layout. Every garden is different, and every particular location has its pros and cons. 
We're going to talk about the three different layouts that we work with and the three different locations that we garden. We've got a front yard garden here at the house. We've got a backyard garden at Holly's mother's house, which is the large garden, as you see in our video productions, as well as the occasional visit to Holly's sister's backyard, which is an incorporation of family area and growing space. And now we may be helping my godparents plant a garden as well. So let's talk about, we've got all different sizes. We've got 200 square feet at the front yard. We've got 1,700 square feet at the big garden. And at the sister-in-law's or Holly's sister's garden, uh, garden backyard, we're looking at about 150 to 175 based on how much more she wants to expand it. Different layouts uh, on these is the, the front yard garden and the sister-in-law's garden is essentially the traditional garden. The, the, the till the soil, well, the spade the soil over, plant in it, that's what it is. The large garden is where we really do a lot of the videos and a lot of the experimental uh, experiments that we, we that you see. We, we've converted it from a traditional garden that you may know of to a what is called a raised berm garden and a going towards a weedless, W-E-E-D-L-E-S-S -S type of garden. So there's an option there. Um, or a few options there. With, with the large garden, the raised berms, there's distinct, the, the benefit of this, the benefit of this is distinct grow areas and permanent walk paths. Because we saw this on a uh, episode 410 of Growing Greener World, and that can be found at growinggreenerworld.com, there was a gardener that done this that they feature. Because on a traditional garden, there's a certain amount of area that you're going to walk regardless of how careful you are because you've got to get in there and harvest that produce. But by doing the raised berm, which is just, you know, kind of, kind of etch out a walk path, throw that soil where the grow area is going to be, and that's that you don't walk on the grow area, you're, you're able to reach across these beds, which is no more than four foot across or two foot across, and you're not compacting that soil that you're growing in. Right. So it's, it's, it's really soft. When you, when we, just drop the garden fork in there. It sinks down really nice and gives the, the plants a nice loose soil. Now, that that's, you know, there's no wrong or right way. To, if, it, if it's effective for you to garden whatever way you're doing it organically, then continue to practice that method. We avoid tilling altogether because of the destruction that it causes the soil, the microbes, and the destruction of worms, cavities, and worms in general. That's why we don't till. We'll spade occasionally, and as we've gotten more into mulching, we're covering the garden as much as we can this year in all areas with a layer of mulch. Now, this can be not, not necessarily wood chips, but with leaves, with dry grass clippings. In some instances, if you have the availability, straw works, mm -hmm. shredded newspaper. This way to suppress the weeds, retain the moisture in the soil, and and utilizing you know a minimum amount of work that needs to be done in the garden. So we've done this, and it can be categorized as the back to Eden method. Back to Eden method is the covering of soil that you're planting in, whether it is with wood chips or other organic materials, for the purpose of suppressing weeds, holding moisture in. So that's what we're doing with the large garden. We're going to practice that in the in the front yard garden here. And based on what materials we may have available, that may also be a practice that we do in the sister-in-law's garden as well. We have noticed in years past that by not covering the soil, you get an enormous amount of weeds, and the soil dries out very, very, very quickly. Right. So that's a, a good garden layout that we have. Yeah. And, and you can, you know, container gardening... You can have those in areas to where if you grow cool weather crops, you can kind of get those in the shade whenever the warm weather begins to um, to creep crop off uh, creep up on you, and you can kind of get an extension on that. So container gardening is a great way. Raised beds, we talked about that in the last episode of the program. You can go back to the website underneath the podcast tab and and listen to that episode. So gardening layouts, you want to kind of look at what you got. If it's not working for you, there's so, you're going to have to change it. You, what what is what is the uh, insanity is the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results correct and some gardeners 
try to do that. They try to do the same thing over and over again, and the same results come. The same results is a disappointment, is a waste of time, is a poor production, and they continue to wonder what they have done wrong. You have to reanalyze what you're doing. Changes will have to be made. You have to take the knowledge that is available to you through websites like ours, through other gardeners who have much more experience and maybe who have gone through the same trials and tribulations that you have and are and you can change what you're doing and most times if not all the time we'll see a tremendous result in a positive sense we appreciate you joining us today on the program if you have any questions you can always visit us at the website there's a big red button that says questions Feel free to contact us, if no more than just to say what you think about how we are doing on the program. If you have questions, feel free to ask them. We will get you an answer or get you a link to a source that can provide you the information that you need. We appreciate you tuning into the program. That wraps things up for us this week. If you have any questions in regarding to any of the topics that we've covered or a problem that you're facing in your particular organic, urban, organic, vegetable garden or rural vegetable garden, feel free to contact us at the website. There's a big red button that says question. Click on that, fill that out. We will get you an answer back, whether it's from us with having the information or we will provide you a link to a source that has have that has the correct information. We're not going to tell you something that's not true just to make you feel good. We're going to get you the correct information. Audio that you've heard on the program is courtesy of freesfx.co.uk and audionutrix.com. Those links are both in the show notes. We use those free copyright-free, royalty-free audio sources to help liven up the podcast. And background music in the two ads are provided by nessella.com and paradigmgardens.com. Till next time, I am Joy Baird. I'm Holly Baird. And we will see you in the garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide and distributed in association with WI Garden Media.